things that look like amusement show types of uh, rides. And so it's so cool to see all of those kinds of communities intersecting. Um, and what I'm uh, going to talk about a little bit today is the intersection of kind of a traditional data visualization community with um, some kinds of projects that are a little bit more ma makery. Um, so for the past about a year now, I've been working on a project called OpenIR, which stands for Open Infrared. And the idea behind that is that um, in this day and age when ecological crises are starting to affect all of us uh, more often and more severely, um, there, are, there is so much uh, data that's been in the public domain for decades now, um, since the 1970s, since sort of the onset of uh, global positioning systems and satellites. And this kind of data is free, it's useful, it's widely used in very limited types of scientific communities, and yet this is, this is data that we can all access. So the idea behind OpenIR is taking a look at the different kinds of um, map software that are out there. Oftentimes they're either, I'm going to adjust my mic just a little bit, oftentimes they're hard to use, they're expensive, or they lack environmental information. So for instance, if you, uh, you know, log on to Google Maps or if you go into Bing, the maps that you see are either limited to lines and points, basically streets and buildings, or they're limited to um, aerial imagery, true color aerial imagery. And yet, when ooh, excuse me. And yet, when you uh, bring in an infrared aspect, for instance, if you go inside of the New York Hall of Science and you take a look at your own image in front of the thermal infrared camera, you'll see all aspect, all kinds of aspects about your own face that you can't see when you're looking at yourself in a in a visible a mirror with visible light. You'll see aspects of heat, and you'll see aspects of uh, or where your face is cool. Now, the infrared spectrum covers thermal information, but it also covers information that can highlight aspects of vegetation. It can highlight uh, concrete very clearly. It can highlight soil grades very clearly. And so this slide sort of um, highlights the different kinds of environmental features that we're working with in uh, bringing environmental data um, into web maps like Google Maps, um, OpenStreetMaps. And one of the things that we're doing is creating a, a risk maps, vulnerability analyses on the fly. Um, and this particular um, example is a flooding risk map of Jakarta, um, our particular area of focus, um, an area that's very vulnerable to, uh, to tsunamis and earthquakes. So I've been talking a little bit about this project, which is very much a software project, a screen-based project, and it's very much a project that spans um, geographies and it spans a, a number of institutions. So this is kind of team advisors and partners. So now I'm going to get into how we're making um, aspects of this more physical and how we're using OpenIR as a visualization platform. So let's see. Can you see this on screen? Sort of? OK. I'll kind of turn it around. A little bit. So what I'm going to talk about right here are um, sort of things that we're tracking and then things that we're using to transmit the information to the infrared maps that we're building. And so I'll come back to this picture in just a second. Do you see the slide now? Okay, great. So um, this right here is a microbial fuel cell. Um, this particular microbial fuel cell is called a mud watt. And basically, it, um, it sort of uh, capitalizes, so to speak, on the byproducts of microbes in mud, the um, conductive byproducts of microbes in mud. So the, uh, the Shawanella and the Geobacter are, are two of the most common microbes that you'll find in you know, your backyard kind of mud. And there are three ways in which um, electron is transferred via these microbes um, from the uh, from the cathode to the anode, so it ba it works like a battery, except for the mud is sort of the conductive material in between the plus and the minus of this mud, and so. Um, a company that um, we work with um, up in Cambridge, they're uh, California-based, called Kigotech, makes these batteries. And um, uh, the guys at Kigotech have participated in studies that have found that um, agricultural mud actually is more um, conducive to bacteria that supports these kinds of batteries. So what 
I'm working on with OpenIR right now is I have 10 of these microbial fuel cells and I'm going around the area around the uh, MIT Media Lab and collecting muds of different types. So this is mud from a nearby farm uh, called Boosa Farm in Lexington, Massachusetts. I've also collected, I, I see a girl over there is very excited about Boosa Farm. I've also collected um, uh, pond mud in Provincetown. Um, uh, Harvard Yard mud, uh, Boston uh, Fens mud, and so the idea is that we're going to collect all different kinds of mud from all different kinds of areas and then cross-reference it against the environmental maps that we've already built and see over time um, the you know the kind of information that that um, that validates each other from this sort of in situ tracking versus the uh, the sort of pervasive tracking of the satellite data. So the sort of intermediate intermediary between the mud and the um, the infrared map that I was talking about earlier is this device, which is called a twine. And the idea behind the twine is that. Um, physical computing can have sort of a high barrier of entry. And what if you could make your objects just talk a little better? So with this twine, you can plug in um, many different kinds of sensors. Built into the box is um, temperature and um, um, orientation sensors. And then what the box does is it tweets, it texts, and it emails whatever message you want to set up. So right now, um, I have uh, this twine set up to send me texts whenever it's colder than 75 degrees. I get these texts that say, twine is cold, twine is cold, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, as the um, hardware comes out for this twine, um, these uh, breakout boards, basically um, additional boards in which you can plug your sensors, um, they're being developed right now in Austin, Texas. The story behind Twine is that um, they also came out of the research group that I'm working uh, as a part of at MIT called Information Ecology, which is very much uh, concerned with how do we consider our um, personal ecology. So in my case, there's very much an environmental aspect, but beyond that sort of traditional aspect of ecology, how do we translate what is physical into what is digital? How do we translate what is digital into what is tangible? So this Twine project is basically going to translate what's going on with um, the voltage levels coming out of um, the mud watt, kind of acting as a multimeter, and then it, we're going to um, we're going to tweet an email to the infrared map and we'll visualize that. So this is the setup. Uh, yeah, please. No, no, not at all. Um, so yeah, there's no um, time-based uh, factor. Um, so this is the setup right here. And then these are some quick screenshots of the OpenIR data viewer. Um, all of these points are mud collection points. And all of these different colored maps are IR maps that highlight um, certain environmental features much more strongly. So this is a moisture highlighting IR map. This is an urban highlight, an impermeable surface highlighting um, infrared map. Uh, this it highlights vegetation very clearly. It pops in red. Um, and this highlights uh, gradations of soil very clearly. So actually, this is the map that I'm most concerned with for this mud battery type of setup. And so um, I was really inspired. I was looking for a sort of um, a systems diagram or looking to make a kind of systems diagram for how I'd like this whole setup to work. And I, I came across this image by a local artist named Bryce Weimer. And I was really inspired by it because it kind of takes the notion of um, of you know a city and and sort of the cross section of a city and that's kind of what we're trying to do with this visualization the sort of um, the the sort of scientific notion but a citizen science notion of um, of taking points on the ground cross referencing that with what with the imagery that you can see in the air and sort of combining those different kinds of data sets the uh, participatory sort of human oriented data um, the environmental ground based data and the um, the sort of hovering above uh, pervasive satellite-based data and com combine it into one visualization. So yeah, that's about my presentation. I'll open it up for questions. Uh, these are all the sites that you can visit to learn about all the pieces in this project a little bit more. And thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Are there any more questions about any of these devices? Sorry, I think I'll need the microphone. Found out any uh, interesting, you know, new new things from this, from all these sensors collecting and collaborating? Have you found anything that interests you, or is so? Um, my role on, the, on this particular project has been much more based on the software end. And we're just starting to connect up all of these sensor-based types of networks right now. Um, so this is kind of an in-process um, talk. But if you visit OpenIR, what we're very much concerned with, with is applying infrared maps to emergency management. So um, I showed you a flood map of Jakarta. And um, we'll be doing a bunch of usability tests there, um, particularly with the maps and, and, um, and crowd mapping, um, user-contributed user eyewitness data. Um, and the, the sensors will come in at later stages um, in, next year. Thank you. I have a question for some of you guys. <laughs> so I've been seeing people wear these really funky blinking pins. And uh, uh, can anybody tell me of anything about that, actually? Yeah? Oh, OK, the soldering workshop. Awesome. That's awesome. OK, cool.